We've all heard it before. I like the book better than the movie. We all know that movies are a visual medium and the ability to really dive deep inside a person's psyche and know what someone is thinking or feeling usually lies more within a book's realm. Stephen King's novel, The Shining, is such a different beast than Stanley Kubrick's film, The Shining. And there's no better place to see that than inside room 217 if you're in King's book and room 237 if you're in Kubrick's vision. These sequences, both in the book and film, are extremely powerful. Yet the reasons behind the why and how are completely different. What I love about this sequence of events in both the book and the film is that they work on total different levels while at the same time using the same techniques and storyline but are portrayed completely differently to convey different things. Let's take a look at the sequence through Kubrick's vision and his delivery. In the film, Danny Torrance is set up. A tennis ball is rolled at him while he plays with his toys and then he sees that room 237 is open with the key in the lock. In the book, he's not lured in at all. He's not prey being tricked into the room. King has him specifically seek out the room. He steals the key and goes in to investigate under the assumption that nothing in there can hurt him. It's just like pictures in a book. He takes Halloran's words as fact. He can't be hurt by anything inside the hotel. They can only scare him. But that's not necessarily true now, is it? Kubrick's use of sound and visuals is on full display here. Look at the carpet, the positioning of the toys, the way the shot is framed, the direction from which the tennis ball rolls in. The symmetry is absolutely perfect. And then Kubrick hijacks our eyes to exactly where he wants us to look. We can only look down the hall. We are entranced with where that ball could have come from. And then he goes into Danny's POV, and the camera is moving a lot more, and the visual gives us the same hallway we've already seen, and that's Kubrick's way of allowing us the liberty of letting our eyes wander. And as we let our eyes wander, we see room 237 on the side, and then Danny sees it and looks out the open door. When Danny goes in, Kubrick transitions with both an audio cut and a visual cut based on his mother. We visually hear him ask if his mom is in there, and we dissolve cut from room 237 to his mother checking the boiler system. And he also connects the two scenes with the eerie background music to keep us tense and fully in the sequence, even though what Wendy is doing isn't really interesting. And then Kubrick changes it up on us. The music changes ever so slightly, and with that slight change in the score, we hear Jack Torrance having his nightmare, yelling, grunting. The book has Jack Torrance falling asleep in the basement while he's going through all the newspaper clippings, invoices, receipts, etc., studying the Overlook Hotel for a possible book. The ultimate F you to that officious little prick, Ullman, and even his quote unquote buddy Al. He falls asleep and he dreams. We learn of his family. We learn of his father who loved little Jackie to death and who Jack absolutely adored the same way Danny does to Jack. We find out about the terrible beating that his father gave to his mother and how they ended up at the hospital and how the mother never said a word about it and how one of his brothers died in the war. We see that Jack has become his dad. The dream has Jack's father telling him to kill Danny, to take his medicine. The book has Wendy knitting and falling asleep, not knowing where Danny is. When Wendy wakes up and hears Jack shouting, her first instinct is that Jack's shouting might not mean that he's in trouble, but that he's done something awful to Danny. Again. In the book, she runs right by Danny who's at the top of the stairs without seeing him or the bruises on his neck. Jack's dream in the film is that he chops up his family to pieces, which obviously works nicely with him having an axe at the end of the film attempting this dream. But the book's focus uses Jack's dad and that backstory and plays on it. We feel for Jack tremendously because of the backstory King has created, and the emotional pain is far worse than the physical pain at this moment. Wendy's focus quickly changes to, where's Danny? But she has that tone, that accusatory tone that Jack can't handle since Danny's arm was injured. Quote, never gonna let me forget that, are you? 
the book heavily relies on the tension between husband and wife, and it intensifies here. It intensifies with backstory and pacing. The cuts in both the film and the book speeds everything up dramatically with its ability to jump into three different scenes in Wendy, Jack, and Danny. The pace, although slow and mysterious, still moves fast like it's the end of a book racing to a dramatic finish. But the film does this further by prolonging the mystery of room 237. In the book, we see the old lady wrap her arms around Danny's neck, unable to leave the room as he realizes they are not just pictures in a book. It's far worse. In the film, Kubrick cuts away from what happened to Danny. We never see what happened. In the book, we see the old lady first. We know what's happened to Danny. In the film, we see the bruises in Danny's catatonic state first. The book has already chosen to give us the scare because King knows that he still has the emotional stuff to hit the reader with. Kubrick doesn't have that. He doesn't have as intense a backstory. He only has the scare and aftermath. King's scare is with Danny. Kubrick's scare is with Jack going inside the room himself. And Kubrick nails the scare, of course. Jack Torrance is a man who's already mad. He could give two shits about his wife, and maybe his boy as well. So when he enters that room, of course he sees a beautiful woman naked. And of course he has no problem kissing her. I mean, what could possibly go wrong in this scenario? Until, of course, he's making out with a disgusting corpse. But the book doesn't take it this far when he visits room 217. We know that the old lady in the room is Lorraine Massey. She's an older married woman who liked to take younger boys to the Overlook. One boy, however, did her dirty, stole her Porsche, and this was one of the reasons she probably stuffed herself with barbiturates and liquor, killing herself in the tub. We know this woman in the book. She's part of the Overlook's past. We don't know her in the film. The scare is in the visual payoff, not the backstory. Wendy's character is far more interesting and unique in the book compared to the film. And again, it's the backstory that King has given us that makes the 217 sequence so strong in the book. Wendy has a horrible relationship with her mother, and Wendy also knows that Danny has taken to his daddy far more than he has taken to her. It kills her. Wendy does everything for the boy and his father has broken his arm and yet the only thing Danny seems to want in her eyes is Jack. She has these awful feelings that she's inadequate and they are exasperated by her mother saying she is indeed a terrible mom. When Wendy sees what happens to Danny, she immediately blames Jack, which makes sense based on his track record. But then there's a huge role reversal, which isn't in the film, but in the book. It's a genius way to play on all of Wendy's fears while letting Jack have that moment of, how does it feel? Danny finally snaps out of his speechless state, pulls away from Wendy's arms, and runs to his father, clutching him. He says, oh daddy, daddy, it was her, her, her. And for a moment, everything has flipped. Wendy and Jack both think that Danny is saying his mother was the one that hurt him. And it goes from bad to worse for Wendy when Jack purposely says something he knows will cut her deep saying she sounds like her mother. Every character in the Overlook is completely put through the ringer in both book and film. Kubrick uses pretty much everything he can to make an unforgettable sequence to create mood, tension, and a great WTF moment, except backstory. King focuses heavily on the backstories he's created in order to make the moments that much more unforgettable and painful for his characters. Kubrick and King capture the same sequence of events in completely different ways, using their abilities in the best way they can, with the tools of their selected mediums. Neither version is wrong. Both styles are memorable and powerful. A lot of times we hear, I like the book better than the movie. But this is what I love about The Shining. You can be obsessed with one and hate the other one. You can love every moment of both of them, Some like the movie better than the book. Some like the Grady twins better than the different aged siblings. Some people like not knowing the point of the dude in a bear suit on his knees. Some like not knowing what the hell the ending means in the Kubrick version. And some like the way King ends it with more answers. And yes, some people actually even love the miniseries that King and Garris created at the Stanley Hotel. But to be fair, I haven't met anyone who loves the film yet. Not gonna lie though, I do own it.